A good chunk of our Bible is dedicated to what is known as the law. However, based on what we've been studying in Romans, many of us could be led to ask ourselves a few questions and maybe even ask God a few questions about the law. Is the law any good? Is there something wrong with this law? Um, in fact, Paul makes some pretty strong statements about the law. Largely, his statements seem to be negative. He tells us things like the law cannot justify. Romans 3.20 says, For no one, no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. Now, knowledge of sin comes through the law, that seems good, but no one can be justified by it. That's not exactly what we want to be told, right? I mean, you get how many books that are the law? Over 30 books. I mean, two-thirds of our Bible are the law. And now we're told no one can be justified by it. Then we're told the law can't even sanctify you. The law can't even make you holy. Once you're saved, you can't even get holy through obeying it. Romans 6.14 says, the sin For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. The implication here is that if we are under the law, then sin rules us. These are some pretty strong statements. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about the law in Romans chapter 7. But before we do, why don't we have a word of prayer and ask God, the Holy Spirit, to be our teacher. Our Father, we come to you now and we're told that Jesus went away. That Jesus went into heaven. He ascended into heaven. That we as Christians might have your Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the comforter. That he might teach us. That he might give understanding. And so now we ask that you would give us understanding, that we, you would explain to us, that you would teach through us, to us, that you would grant us understanding that you would give us knowledge, that you would help us to understand your truth. God, I pray that you would teach through me that I would disappear, that your truth would be explained, that you would grant us the ability not only to comprehend with factual understanding, but actually your wisdom of what you are saying. That we would be drawn closer to you this morning. That it wouldn't simply be a lecture, God. That it wouldn't just simply be another time where we came in on a Sunday and heard some man speak. But that, Lord, we were encountering the living God. For, Lord, that's why we're here. To worship you. To be with your body. And to be with you. So, God, we ask that you would speak to us. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. So Paul makes some strong statements, and it's very easy for Paul to be misunderstood. And some have said, in fact, Paul realizes it as he speaks. Paul might be saying that the law is evil. If we turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, we start in verse 7 as we continue our journey in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 7. What should we say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. Paul now defends the law by explaining how the law has worked in his own life. This is what he's going to do for us. He he answers the question that the law is not sin, but he wants to give an explanation. He wants to give understanding. He's like the law the law isn't sin. The law isn't the problem. And so he wants to give some understanding. He's, and so he wants to help us to understand. He says the law exposes sin. The law reveals sin nature. And so Paul goes on in Romans 7 and says, On the contrary, I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. For example, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, Do not covet. And sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. 
Isn't that the way? For apart from the law, sin is dead. The minute we know what wrong is, all of a sudden wrong is happening everywhere. And so he says the law began to expose what sin was, and all of a sudden Paul realized he was doing it all the time, everywhere. Without the law, Paul says, you don't know your own sinfulness. You don't realize it's happening. Paul isn't saying that there is no sin without the law. What he is saying is that those with who, those who have not had the written law don't fully grasp their sin because they don't really understand what it is. They don't understand the law, and so they don't get it. Look at your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Although I once had confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has ground for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding righteousness that is in the law, blameless. Really? Really, Paul? Blameless? That kind of blew, blew me away that he would say that. Yet he says that. Regarding the righteousness that is in the law, Paul says he was blameless. That is quite a statement, isn't it? Look at Luke 16, verse 15. I put it up here for you. It says, Jesus told them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of others. But God knows your hearts. For what is highly admired by people is revolting in God's sight. This is the real key, isn't it? Paul had no problem with outward obedience. Remember, there was that guy that came to Jesus, right? He had that obedience down. He asked Jesus, what do I need to do? And Jesus said, obey the law. And he said, I got that. And so then Jesus gave him one more thing to do, right? And the guy walked away sad. He was so close. Even Jesus said he was this close. But he couldn't do it. His heart wasn't right. And so Jesus points it out in Luke 16, 15. God knows your hearts. And so the problem is, again, the problem is the heart issue. See, what the law reveals, the law uncovers the depravity. It uncovers the depth of the depravity of man. Look at John chapter 3 and verse 19 and 20. Look at John chapter 3 verses 19 and 20. We're told this then is the judgment. This then is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. You see, the law reveals sin as an offense against God. It shows the offense. It exposes what it is. But see, what Jesus did then, when the light came, to, came down, what does he do? He demonstrates something else. He shows something more, doesn't he? Remember the Sermon on the Mount? What does he do? He starts showing even greater problems. He says, don't commit you say don't commit adultery. He says, I say don't lust. He starts exposing the heart problem. Right? He shows it's not just this. It's deeper. He says, the law says don't murder, but really it's deeper. I say don't hate. See, he said, the law was the surface trying to keep you here. <laughs> and many of you couldn't even do the surface issue. But the heart's a greater issue. And so Jesus started exposing the real problem. The light came down and really shone into the heart. And he's the light. And as he started doing that, now there was real problems, wasn't there? Well, the law revealed sin as an offense to God. And the law goes beyond external behaviors. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 and 22. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 and 22 through 22. 
For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. How many of you have ever been angry? All right, good deal. Um, and whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. By the way, I grew up in the 80s. How many of you ever watched the A-team? Mr. T, B.A. Baracus, I pity the fool. Yeah, I grew up saying that. Said to his brother's fool. I'm pretty sure I said that to my little brother on like a daily basis there for a while. Now, I didn't know what the Sanhedrin was, and I wasn't Jewish, so I didn't have a Sanhedrin problem, but uh, still. Whoever says, you moron, I know I said that quite a bit in the 80s, will be subject to hellfire. Hmm. That's problematic, right? I won't ask for a show of hands of whoever said moron, but that's not a good situation, right? The law reveals some issues. It goes beyond an external behavior and reveals a heart problem. By the way, how many of you would say moron's a bad word, <laughs> generally speaking? Think of, oh yeah, that's one of those little... That's a five-letter word. That's not one of those four-letter words. <laughs> one of those five-letter words. Those one of those bad five-letter words. Jesus seems to have an issue. The law goes beyond thou shalt not. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Yeah, I know we're going way back. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. We're going to go way back. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. You know, somebody spent their serious time this week in Leviticus, right? Leviticus 19, verse 18. You are to keep my... That's not the verse I wanted. <laughs> Not the verse I wanted. Must not crossbreed two different kinds of your livestock. Yeah, that is not the verse I intended. Um, huh. 18, there we go. Do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I was at 1919. Sorry. There we go. 1918 was the right verse. Boy, helps to read the right verse. Thank you. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see, it's not just don't do things, but we are supposed to do things. The law reveals hearts. The Pharisees were focused heavily on what they shouldn't do, weren't they? They didn't focus a lot about doing things. They didn't focus a lot about loving. They were focused heavily on what they shouldn't do. Really heavily on that. But the law reveals hearts. It exposed things. But Paul focused on coveting. This is the example he gave them. And so let's go back to his example in Romans. The example of coveting. He says, for, for example, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, had not said, do not covet. Now, why does Paul choose the Tenth Commandment to represent the whole law? Well, you see, the law, the Tenth Commandment deals explicitly with the desires of our heart, doesn't it? It deals with what our heart wants. And once we understand that our desires are wrong, we are faced with the reality that we have broken the whole of the law, right? When our desires are wrong, the law is an issue for us. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. Therefore put to death what belongs to your worldly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Understand, when we realize the things that we want are not right, now we've got problems, don't we? One of the things I was taught in one of the first counseling courses I took, it was a saying, we do what we do 
because we want what we want it. Real simple statement, right? We do what we do because we want what we want. It was like a real simple analysis, real simple, easy thing to say is, why did you do that? And people will make all kinds of reasons and explanations for why they did what they did. And you could always come back to, well, what did you want? To, what, did you want? what were you trying to get? <laughs> and we come back to, well, this is what you really wanted. I was like, oh, you do, did what you did because you wanted what you wanted. Our desires were sinful. I wanted this. My motives were wrong. We do what we do because we want what we want. My desires were wrong. This is why Colossians tells us, even as Christians, to put to death our wrong desires, our evil desires, those things which still belong to our worldly nature. Now, the law, we're told, arouses our sin nature to act. Now, how's that possible? It's the Bible, right? It, the law is Scripture. How does Scripture arouse my sin nature to act? How does the law produce sin? That doesn't seem right, does it? Well, before the law comes, the sinful nature may lie dormant. This is what Paul tells us. Go back to Romans chapter 7. Look at verse 8. Romans chapter 7 and verse 8. It says, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. See, he wouldn't have under understood that he was doing it. He wouldn't have realized, I'm not coveting. Or for a better example, right? I wouldn't have wanted to touch the burner if I hadn't been told, don't touch the burner. Right? The little kid told don't touch that, it's hot. I don't touch that. And now it's put in the kid's head. I shouldn't touch that, so I want to touch that. The kid probably was walking around not thinking, touch the burner. Now the kid wants to touch the burner. Well, Paul wasn't thinking I should covet my neighbor's stuff until he was told, don't covet your neighbor's stuff. And now he's thinking, I want to covet my neighbor's stuff. He says... This is what the law has done. The law challenges our autonomy. Because all of a sudden we're told, don't do this. And what does our autonomy say? What do we say? And this is a great American thing, right? We say things like, I have the right. Right? We have rights. I can do what I want to do. Right? All right. Maybe this one. You can't stop me. No, that sounds like a teenager. Little kid. Maybe younger than a teenager. You can't stop me. See, the provocative power of the law is a, a matter of everyday experience, isn't it? You can't stop me. I can do what I want. I have the right. This is, this is legal stuff right now, isn't it? Isn't this what we're dealing with with bathrooms in the law today? I have the right to have transgender bathrooms. It's my right. I can go into any bathroom that I want to go into. It's my right. I have the right. Isn't that this? I have the right. Understand we do what we do because we want what we want. It really is that simple. The law is so provocative. It challenges everything in us. It, it challenges us to respond, to react. And we're, we're okay with it because it doesn't hit us. So if I'm a heterosexual male, I don't get hit by that, do I? It doesn't bother me. I see the men's room, and I'm not bothered by that at all. Never once did I think, hmm, yeah, I should be allowed to go into the women's room. Never once did that occur to me at all. At all. And all of you are sitting there thinking, that's good, Pastor Tom.
But we all have sins we struggle with. And the minute we come up against the law that goes against the sin we struggle with, that's when it hits. And understand, this is what Paul's getting at. He uses covet as the example. That's what he's doing. He's using it as his example. And saying, I hit covet because here it is, the example is the one that hits me. Because covet hits, and I'm like, I'm walking along, no problem. And then I see, don't covet, and all the, over there is my neighbor's stuff. And I'm like, I like my neighbor's stuff. What do you mean I can't want my neighbor's stuff? I don't have that stuff. I kind of want my neighbor's stuff now. What do you mean I can't want my neighbor's stuff? Of course I want my neighbor's stuff. You can't tell me I can't want my neighbor's stuff. I want it right now. And there he goes. And that's how it works. It's really that simple, isn't it? The one thing the church really needs to do as we deal with things like homosexuality and, transgen and transgenderism and all these other things, we do need to be more understanding. We really do. Because at the base of it, is a struggle against sin that is very similar to the every struggle that we've ever faced. Because it is. Because it's a struggle that we face that is exactly what Paul is describing here. And he uses the example of coveting. But it's a struggle. And I may not relate to it specifically, but I understand scripturally that it's real, that it's true. Now, the question is, if the law is doing this, and I think this is the next valid question, why in the world is it a good thing that the law exposes sin and does this very thing? Because if the law is doing this and we get so much of the law, why is it a good thing that the law would do this and expose our sin in such a way? Right? Because this is what it does. I mean, that's a, that's a miserable kind of situation to be in, right? Because all of a sudden Paul's going along, doesn't realize that he's doing this, isn't coveting, and now all of a sudden he's coveting, and now he knows it's a bad thing. Back to the little kid that all of a sudden now he wants to touch the burner, right? He didn't want to touch the burner, and now he's been told don't touch the burner, and all he can think about doing is touching the burner. Right? Except for Melissa's kids, because Melissa's kids get told don't touch the burner, and they never want to touch the burner. I'm assuming. Well, here's the deal. It's good that the law exposes our sin in this way. If we do not realize that we have sin, if we do not know about our struggle, we will not realize a need for a Savior. And if we do not understand this, we cannot come to grips with what we deserve. This is a good thing, right? If I don't know that I deserve hell, if I don't know that I've sinned, if I don't know that I go against the law, if I don't know my desires are against it, if I don't know that I struggle with it, if I don't know that I deserve hell and that I need a Savior, will I ever come to Jesus? No. I won't, right? If I don't know that I need Him, if I don't know that I break the law, if I don't understand my very nature goes against it, why would I come to Him? So Paul is getting us to understand the law actually is a very good thing even for us. That's good news, right? So Paul says, here's the deal. Guys, the law is good because it, it condemns you. The law is good because it condemns you. 30-some books to condemn you. And so Romans chapter 7, in verse 9, he says, Once... 
I was alive from the law, apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin sprang to life. Think about that. When the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. The commandment that was meant for life resulted in death for me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So here's Paul's experience with the law. See, first, Paul thought he was alive. Now, this doesn't mean he was spiritually alive, but actually it was quite the opposite. Paul wasn't spiritually alive. We know that. He was in a state of spiritual complacency, imagining that he was actually pleasing to God. He thought he was okay. That's what he thought was going on, that he was an okay guy, right? You know people like that, walking along through life thinking they're fine, that aren't? They're just going through life, bobbing along. Everything's good. They don't know that they're headed straight to hell. But they're bobbing along just fine with God, they think. That's where Paul was before the law exposed him. That's what he's saying. He thought everything was good. And then Luke, in Luke 18, 11 through 12 says, The Pharisee took his stand and was praying like this, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. I thank you I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. Do you know anybody like that? People think they're pretty good? Do they just think they're good people? That's where Paul was. He thought he was a good guy. Thought he was fine. Thought he was okay. This is the condition of every unbeliever initially. They think they're fine. They think they're okay. That's what he thinks is going on. He thinks he's moving along on the right track. It's kind of tragic, isn't it? To think that everyone thinks they're okay. Things like this, I have a good heart. I'm basically a good guy. I'm basically a good person. Oh, I make mistakes, but I'm basically a good person. Well, God's commandments, when they come to Paul, they come with power, don't they? Because they expose reality to him. They explain the truth to Paul. Now, he doesn't like it. It's not that Paul didn't know the law in an external sense, was it? In fact, Paul was training to be a Pharisee, so he knew it in a very real external sense. But when it got through to his heart, something changed, didn't it? He realized where he really was. The law hadn't done its work in his soul yet. And when it did that, everything changed. Sin sprang to life. All of a sudden, he realized what was really going on. You ever met somebody in that spot where all of a sudden they realize how condemned they really are? That's both a scary and an exciting place to be when that happens. When you meet somebody like that. Because they are either going to repent and come to Christ, or bad things are on the way. Sin sprang to life, and he had a shocking sense of how far short he actually fell of God's standard. He finally realized exactly what was going on with him. You see, he realized he was coveting. He realized not only did he break this law, but he realized he broke the law. That meant he fell short of God's law, period. End of story. Because you can't just break one and... The rest are okay at that point. And he knew it. He understood it. To fall short of God's law meant all the law was broken. And he understood that's what it meant. And now it was, it was all over for Paul. What does that mean? He's, he's, he's now the lawbreaker. It, it, was, it was all over. 
He realized he had died to all hopes of his, his salvation through the law of being the good person that could get to heaven. Now what could he do? This is what Paul's trying to explain, is what the law was doing in his life. This ends up being a good thing for him then, right? Ultimately, it ends up being a good thing. He realized that all of his, quote-unquote, I put, should have put that in quote, spiritual accomplishments were really rubbish. They were trash. He hadn't done anything, had he? Really? Philippians 3, 7, and 8, Paul says this, But everything that was gained to me I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth so that I may gain Christ. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. The law which he expected to give him life instead revealed to Paul that he was actually dead. He was actually dead. He wasn't alive at all. He wasn't doing well. <laughs> he wasn't okay. Things were in bad, bad shape. He says, and I died. The commandment that was meant for life resulted in death for me. Man, this is not good for Paul, is it, at this point? In the spot that he's at at that moment, they resulted in death. Sin uses the law to deceive and condemn you. That's what we see in verse 11. By making you think that you are capable of earning God's favor by external law-keeping. Isn't it amazing that so many people can somehow think they can earn their way to heaven? If I'm just good enough, if I just do enough, by the way, this is what all false religion is based on. Just do enough good things. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, Muslims, they're all based on that same basic premise. Enough goodness, enough acts, enough things. Do it a certain way. Oh, they build it around certain principles or different kind of ideals, but it's all the same basic thing. You do it a certain way and you will get there if you're just good enough. God's the only one that says, truth is, you can't be me. You can't get there. I'm going to have to do it for you. So I will. So he did. And that's why he had to make it so easy for us. Because the reality is no action on our part is ever going to get us there. No action on our part. So by the law with sin deceives and condemns us, makes us think we can get there. It makes us believe that the law on its own can constrain sin. And if we if we just use the law in a certain way, if we just obey the law, sin will somehow be bound up, it'll be constrained, it'll be tied up, and then we'll just obey the law, and, and sin will be under our control, and we can tie it up, and we can o obey the law, and then sin won't be in, in charge anymore. How many of you have mastered sin on your own? Nobody? Good. Because you can't. But sin somehow thinks it can deceive us into believing that we can. Sin uses the law to make us think that God's law appears to be unreasonable and oppressive. This was the first lie that Satan gives in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. Look at that with me, Genesis 3, verse 5. He starts way back there with this. Isn't that amazing? He starts way back there. I mean, way back then, God doesn't even give a lot of commands. There's not much to obey at this point, right? You don't have to do much to be obedient to God in the garden. This is pretty simple stuff. If you just do one thing, right? Don't eat of one tree. 
one thing. All you got to do is one thing. It's like the what? Don't touch the stove. One thing. So what do they do? The one thing. Genesis 3, verse 5. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See? God's unreasonable. See, what God really knows is that you're going to become like Him. He knows you're going to be like Him, and God just doesn't want you to be that smart and that wise. And God's not being a good God. That's really what's happening here. And if he were a good God, he'd want you to be like him. He'd want you to be wise. And he'd want you to eat the fruit. So really what's happening is God's not being a good God. And that's why he's not letting you eat that fruit. Eat. Being unreasonable. That's how he paints the picture. Isn't that what sin does with the law? Isn't that what it does? Over and over and over. With abortion. Well, it's unfair that you should have to carry that child to term. It's unfair that you should have to ruin your life and have to carry that child. That's an unfair thing. That's not fair for your life that you should have to, you made a mistake, you shouldn't have to bear the brunt of that, that mistake for the rest of your life. That's unfair. That's what sin says. You see, sin tells the same lies over and over and over and over in different situations every time. It's what it's doing all over society today. It's no different. See, when we read the Bible, we read this thing that's over 2,000 years old, even in the newest parts. It applies right now. It impacts today in the 21st century. It hits right where we are. And I read where our culture is, and I see where we're hitting right now, and I see this passage, and I think, man, the people we know, they need this. Because the lies that sin is telling about our God about his law, about the truth, about grace. They're buying it. Who knows, we might be buying it right now. Paul did. That's what he's telling us. Paul, the apostle, he bought these lies. He, that's what he's telling us. His experience with the law was he listened to these lies. If Paul listened, guess what? We probably have listened at different times too. He says, not only that, sin uses the law by causing us to discount the consequence of our disobedience. Look at verse 4 of Genesis 3. He says, no, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. You ever do that with sin? Discount what will really happen? Yeah. Sin tells lies to us all the time, doesn't it? Convinces us that it's not really as bad as it is. See, the law is there to tell us. God wants us to understand. He's painted the real picture. He's laid it out. And He's laid it out for the world. And the world doesn't want to hear and Satan doesn't want the world to hear, and he doesn't want believers to hear, and we don't listen, and the world doesn't listen. And church, if we don't listen, if we don't take sin seriously, then why will the world? If we don't take our own sin seriously, why would the world? What good then is the law? The law can achieve a great thing in us because it can bring us to the end of ourselves. 
Understand, it can bring us to the end of ourselves. So is something wrong with the law? We've looked at it, right? We've talked about it. Look at Romans 7, 12, and 13. So then, the law, therefore, when we understand how sin interacts with it, when we understand Paul's interaction with it, the law is holy. The commandment is holy and just and good. Therefore, did what is good cause my death, Paul says? Absolutely not. On the contrary, sin, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that through the commandment, the law, sin might become sinful beyond measure. Paul says, no, 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 it's not, it's not the, the fault of the law. He said, the fault is not with the law, but with, but with you, but, but, but with me. The fault was with me, Paul says. The law is not sin. God's law is holy, righteous, and good. He's like, under, understand, it's, it's not the law that's the issue. He's like, we've made a mistake. We've made errors. The law displays God's holy character. It demonstrates who he is and how high his standard really is. And that's supposed to be Christians reflected in us. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16 says, Be holy as the Lord your God is holy. I mean, it says it, right? That's something that he's at work in us to make us like. The law is righteous, declaring God's perfect justice. The law is good, expressing God's benevolence. That his, it expresses his goodness. That's huge. 1 John 5.3, turn in your Bibles to that one. I want you to see that. 1 John 5, verse 3. How many of you say you love God? 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is what love for God is, to keep His commands. Now His commands are not a burden, because whatever has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. And who is the one who conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? <clears throat> if we love God, we obey Him. It's a simple thing. It's not that the obedience is what saves us. James says faith is an action, basically. Faith does. Real faith moves. It doesn't just stay inactive. The law is not responsible, Paul says, for our death. It proves and shows that we were dead. It doesn't cause it. It just demonstrates. It exposes it. It essentially opens the casket up and says, oh, look, there's a dead body in there. He didn't put the dead body in there. It just... Shows there was one. Your own sinful nature, not the law, is the murderous villain. The law simply shows how sinful you really are. How dead you really were. The sinfulness of sin confirmed in the fact is confirmed in the fact that it, it uses God's good law. Good law. As an implement of death. That is to demonstrate the death, to show the death. I know I keep using this word death a lot today. Last week we talked a lot about life, right? <laughs> so we move this week into death. God is a, a God that deals with these two things a lot. There's a reason. Because he is very concerned about life. He is very concerned about it. And if you had a creation that is filled with death, You'd be very concerned about bringing those things which are dead and, and bringing them to life, right? We have and we live in a world full of death. Do we not? We walk in a world of zombies. 
It's just true. They desperately need brought to life. That's why we talk about this. That's why we deal with this. That's why it's important for us to understand the purpose of the law. So that we can know and relate and expose. Here's the point. The law is here to make us realize our sin so that we might seek the forgiveness from God. Even as Christians, the purpose of the law in our lives is to help us understand when we are sinning. Do you get that? If we are to become holy, we need to understand where sin is, right? We need to be able to see it for ourselves. That's why we saw that passage in Colossians that tells us to get rid of all those things from us. I'm supposed to be holy. How can I be holy if I don't know what sin looks like? Let's turn back to Luke 18, 9 through 14, the passage that Brandon read for us. We're not going to read that whole passage, but we want to look back again at it. Luke 18. We talked about the Pharisee who praised God and was praying and thanked him that he wasn't like the tax collector. But in verse 13, we read these words, But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, turn your wrath from me, a sinner. Then Jesus said these words, I tell you, in verse 14, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The fulfillment of the law comes through the work of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says these words. Come, let us discuss this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they will be like wool. The law exposes who we are, where we stand. You black that out for me. Just hit the B there. Thank you. I don't know the specific sins you're struggling with today. But Scripture tells me that you're not perfect. So that I'm guaranteed. God wants to change each one of us. He wants to make us different. He wants to purify us. He wants to do a work in our lives. Don't let today be the day where you just walk out and let that just go a separate way. Let today be that day where you agree with Paul and say, you know what, it's, it's time. God's exposed it. Let today be the day where anger is done. Where you say, you know what, I'm not going to let anger be my master anymore. I'm not going to let anger be this thing that I struggle, continue to struggle with. That I'm going to, I'm going to be done with anger now. Where you say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to struggle with lust anymore. I'm going to give lust to God. You know what sins you're struggling with? It's time to give it to Him, and let Him change. Only he can do that. Would you stand with me as we sing to our Lord?